How have different types of architectures changed over time? Most of the time when people talk about architecture, they're talking about application architecture because that's the kind that most people encounter, particularly as you're a developer. And that's the realm of frameworks and you know transit dependencies and that sort of stuff. But you can also talk about uh, different kinds of technical architecture like integration architecture um, and even enterprise architecture. And one of the ways that the role of architecture has changed a lot over the last few years was used to architects were predominantly around application architecture and that's where they honed a lot of their skills. But then when you get into service-based architectures or microservices, which is all the rage right now, that's inherently an integration-based architecture. And there are a lot of challenges that come up when you move from application to integration architecture. Uh, Peter Deutsch very famously called out some of those things in the 80s, uh, which is now in Wikipedia, called the fallacies of distributed computing. It's all these mistakes that you make when you stumble from application architecture into integration architecture, like assumptions that you, there's no latency and that transport cost is zero and there's only one administrator and all these mistaken assumptions you make. So uh, in a lot of ways, the scope of the problem we're solving technically has gotten a lot broader because now we're dealing with integration architecture uh, as the default and standard in many cases. And enterprise architecture has also changed significantly over the last few years because enterprise architecture for a long time, back when uh, there was a strong desire for cost savings in enterprise software. And so a lot of enterprise architecture was around governance and cost savings and figuring out reasonable constraints to make sure that you maximize cost savings. But when you move into the realm where software is a competitive advantage, then software suddenly becomes, those choices become more strategic from a business standpoint. And so even things like enterprise architecture is shifting now from more of a kind of governance and cost saving model more to a guidance model. So uh, despite what may be appearances to some people who watch all the videos and interviews and other things I do, I still do professional work uh, for ThoughtWorks as well as a consultant. And I've met recently with a lot of enterprise architects who are, I wouldn't say panicky, but they're really concerned because the things that you used to know about enterprise architecture are quite different now because the world is quite different now. And so I get a lot of questions about what does enterprise architecture look like in, in 2016? And so that's something that I'm actually f focusing a lot of my efforts on in the next year, both at the, the two upcoming O'Reilly software conferences, but also in the, uh, the series of books and videos I have for O'Reilly around software architecture, is trying to kind of rejuvenate the ideas of enterprise architecture in the completely different world that we find ourselves in now. What does it look like? in 2016? Well, it's a lot more about guidance. So, you know, enterprise architecture, uh, one of its main roles has always been to map kind of the, uh, the business goals and strategies to IT capabilities. Uh, when it's done well, that's really what you do as an enterprise architect, to stitch those things together and make sure that your IT capabilities support your long-range business strategies. And for a long time, the, the overarching business strategy was software's overhead, so cost savings is one of our most important roles in enterprise architecture. Uh, and m maybe not the most important, but certainly high on the list of factors that they take into account. But now when you're in a world of continuous delivery, there's a famous quote by a science fiction uh, author, William Gibson, that gets trotted out a lot. Uh, in these kind of situations that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And there's still a lot of companies that view things like engineering efficiency and continuous delivery uh, as kind of luxuries because they still view software as overhead. Mm -hmm. But you see a lot of markets where uh, continuous deployment is kind of de rigueur because now they're in a market where a slow cycle time to market is now drag on their business and so it's become strategic to the business to do that. And so uh, that's, you're seeing that shift is being driven, this perspective shift is being driven because the realities of the market are becoming a lot different and software is becoming more and more uh, strategic as time goes by. Uh, why are you writing a book about evolutionary architecture? Well, that's really, so the, this change in enterprise architecture is really one aspect of this idea of evolutionary architecture. That uh, So I'm writing this book with Rebecca Parsons and Pat Kwa, my two colleagues, and we've all been thinking about slightly different aspects, but with a big overlap in the Venn circles around evolutionary architecture. And one of the things we've realized is uh, 
you can't predict anything anymore, anymore in the software world because of this problem we're referring to as the dynamic equilibrium of the software development ecosystem. Uh, because it always accommodates new disruptive things that come into the ecosystem and it forms a new equilibrium. So for example, uh, if two years ago you're an enterprise architect and you created a five-year plan for how we're going to allocate our resources and spending, et cetera, and you didn't accommodate Docker, Mm -hmm. As soon as Docker hits that ecosystem, you have to take that plan and wad it up and throw it away sure. because it's irrelevant now. So that's used to be one of the main functions of enterprise architecture was long-term planning. But long-term planning doesn't exist anymore because you can't plan when there's no foundation because the foundation is always shifting in dynamic equilibrium. So that's why we're spending a lot of time and effort in thinking about, well, if predictability is no good anymore, what's the next best thing? It's adaptability. Mm. If you can adapt, much more easily and readily to all these changes, then you don't have to fear them and you don't have to predict them long term because you can adapt in real time. And that's really this idea of evolutionary architecture, building architectures that support change as a first class citizen so that you can get into this world of not having to predict the future and being able to accommodate sometimes surprising disruptive changes to the equilibrium. Uh, hopefully you can accommodate those things much more cleanly in the future. So I, I just want to kind of glom onto something you're talking about there. Do you feel that the shift from predicting to adapting is a major shift? I mean, does that fundamentally change things? It has to, mm -hmm. because I mean, so if you're trying to do cost savings and other things, predictability is a good thing, but it doesn't exist in our world. And I don't think this is going to get better. I think it's only going to get worse as new things happen and you know, and, and the ripple effect of things happening. I mean, I would argue that it wasn't even Docker that caught was the the beginning. You know. Uh, uh, butterfly wings in China that mm -hmm. caused this storm. But you know, it, part of it was, so you know, architectures used to be built around the idea that, uh, well, operating systems are expensive commercial things, so you have to have licenses. So mm -hmm. it was a strong desire to build architectures that use shared resources really effectively. But then Linux got good enough. It got accepted in enterprises and, uh, and it's free from a cost standpoint. And then things like Puppet and Chef came along, which made it free operationally. And then you need some, way, some sort of way to generalize that, and that becomes Docker. And so, you know, this the, the, you can kind of trace backwards. Had to see those things happen, but it's almost impossible to sure. trace forward. So, right. uh, we think that, and this is just going to get worse and worse over time. So that's why we're spending a lot of time and effort in thinking about adaptability and, and being. We're, we're talking about being pro and reactive rather than predictive. Be proactive about thinking about, you know, there's a lot of memes in this area around last responsible moment and building anti-corruption layers, the domain-driven design world. When you wire yourself to an API rather than wire yourself directly, create an anti-corruption layer in between. And so there are a lot of techniques like that that can sort of future-proof your architecture so that it can be a lot more adaptable. Great. Well, thank you for being with us. My pleasure.